Again, I'm Anita Nickerson. I'm the Executive Director of Fair Vote Canada. I'm joined with, by Jean-Sebastian uh, from MDN in Quebec, who's also on our board and is going to help with anything in French. We are thrilled tonight to be joined by Jagmeet Singh, the leader of the federal NDP and member of parliament for Burnaby South. Jagmeet was previously on Ontario NDP MPP and the deputy leader of the Ontario NDP from 2015 to 2017. So Jagmeet is going to talk about building a better democracy for about 20 minutes and then we will take some questions for Jagmeet for another 20 minutes. Uh, so feel free to uh, type in your questions while he's talking and now I'm going to turn it over to Jagmeet. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you and my apologies I wasn't on mute. These are some of the uh, technical gaps that happen when we're doing tech <laughs> Zoom calls and, and video calls in this new era of technology for everyone to stay connected. Um, merci infiniment pour avoir la chance, l'opportunité de parler avec vous. Uh, C'est vraiment un grand honneur. Uh, J'ai hâte de partager mes idées, mais aussi de répondre aux vos questions. Et si vous avez des questions en français aussi, je suis prêt de répondre en français. Aussi, si vous parlez Punjabi, je peux parler Punjabi aussi. Um, uh, friends, I also just want to acknowledge that when we, and I see folks doing it in the chat, when we acknowledge the traditional territories that were gathered on, and I'm in the Mississaugas New Credit, also Haudenosaunee Anishinaabeg in the Toronto area. We also acknowledge the injustice that first people of this land have faced and continue to face. And hopefully we collectively commit to doing something about that injustice. So uh, I've got a, a bunch of things that I want to touch on. And uh, first off, I want to thank Fair Vote and everyone that's participating today. Fair Vote has been a part of moving the dialogue forward, pushing for more democracy, and a more participatory form of democracy with ideas around how do we get people more civically engaged. So I want to shout out all the organizers, all the people that make Fair Vote do its thing. Thank you so much for being a part of making our country and making democracy even better. Uh, I want to share with you, which is something that you probably are not surprised about. I am a strong supporter of proportional representation and ensuring that everyone's voice counts. And as proof point for why it's so important, I want to talk to you about my recent experience in provincial parliament and in federal parliament, majority and in minority governments. I've had uh, a really distinct honor of being both in provincial parliaments where there's been majority and minority. And I can tell you that in minority, the ability to enact change, the ability to have more accountability has been just profoundly different than being in a majority government where it's much more difficult to be able to work with the government or even push the government to change. And similarly, at the federal level, we've seen both. I've been involved in, a, in about a year sitting as, as a member of parliament when the parliament was a majority government. And now in a minority government, we've been uh, at the heart of a lot of changes. I can say during this pandemic, and, and I should just take a moment to pause and reflect on the fact that a lot of people I know are struggling in this pandemic, and a lot of people are, have been left behind. I want you to know I see you and I hear you, and we are gonna do everything we can to make sure your voice is heard, but more importantly, you get the help that you need. In this minority government though, during this pandemic, while people have been struggling, we're really proud to say we've been able to push the government to improve or to implement almost every program that you see that's come out from initially, I remember in early March, raising the question that with a pandemic looming, that people need to have direct access to financial support. And the prime minister responded saying, no, EI would be good enough and we'd just make it easier to access EI. And I said to the prime minister Trudeau, that's, that's not sufficient, that's not gonna be good enough. And we pushed for the CERB. Initially it was $1,000, which was offered by the government. You might recall, we pushed them to increase it to $2,000. They initially excluded students. We pushed them to include students. And then students got the CESB. But these are things that we negotiated, we pushed for, we fought for, and then we passed motions in the house, held the government to account, and were able to achieve that. But the government needed us. When they were at a 10% wage subsidy, and we pushed them to a 75%, it was because they needed our help to pass motions in the house that we were able to achieve that. We were able to push the government to move to that direction. Um, and then recently in negotiating for a way for us to move forward for the next month in June and the summer months in negotiating what parliament would look like, we were able to negotiate 
one of the, the first bold steps in a new national social program, the first new social program nationally in probably a generation with a commitment that the government made that we pushed Prime Minister Trudeau to make on the 10 days of paid sick leave. And so we're proud that we've been able to push the government. And I can tell you it's been completely different being in a minority government than in a majority, as you might assume. But we've been really able to engage with the government. One thing, though, I might point out, people have asked me, has the relationship been collaborative? Have you been working together? And if I can be honest with you all, it hasn't been collaborative. It's been more so we've been pushing for things and we don't let up. We're persistent. We put a lot of pressure. And then the government kind of eventually agrees to our demands weeks later. So it's not as collaborative as I would like, but we're still able to get the results. So it's, it's pretty incredible. Uh, I've, I've read some, the, the poll talked about the new normal, and, and I want to just kind of talk about that for a quick moment. We, we've looked at the, the issues that have come out, uh, about as a result of, or the issues that have come to light during this pandemic. And I want to highlight something. COVID-19 didn't create the inequalities or the problems that we see. COVID-19 as a pandemic has exposed them. So we know for a long time there's been problems with healthcare. There's been problems with our social safety net that was designed in the 70s that doesn't respond to the realities of people right now with contract work and precarious employment. And long-term care really sadly has been at the heart of the exposing of the inequality in, in our healthcare system. And the fact that seniors living in long-term care were the ones that bore the brunt of were the ones that bore the brunt of, of, the, of the losses that seniors living in long-term care lived in hor- live, continue to live in horrible conditions and are the highest number of people that died really shows and exposes the inequality. So when people talk to me about going back to normal, I say, we don't want to go back to normal. Normal was long-term care residents and seniors living in horrible conditions. Normal is those who are the most essential workers getting paid the least. Normal was an electoral system that denies people their ability to participate fully and have their voices heard. Normal was a healthcare system that was effectively starved of funding for so long. We can't go back to normal. We need to move forward to something better. And and that's why we've been talking about how do we build a better Canada out of this crisis? That we don't wanna go backwards. Let's go forward to something better where we invest in a social safety net that is there for people when they need it. We invest more in healthcare that covers people from head to toe. We invest in jobs that are long lasting and sustainable, and we invest in jobs that help us reduce the emissions while creating good opportunities for work. And we make the wealthiest pay their fair share. That's another thing that we've been pushing in this crisis that no company that receives public help should be registered in an offshore tax haven where they're purposely cheating the public of resources and cheating the public of money. So these are some of the things that we've laid out. Uh, We think that when it comes to the CERB, we want it to be universal. We want everyone who needs it to be able to access it. And we also want to explore what we talked about in the campaign. What does a universal basic income or a livable guaranteed income look like? And let's get some evidence to counter some of the stereotypes or some of the misconceptions around what that type of support would do for people. We know the pilot project in Ontario did a lot to undermine some of those stereotypes and myths and show that in fact, By helping people in that way, we're able to see great outcomes in health, people who are able to live better lives and able to contribute more and actually are able to be uh, able to achieve their full potential. So there's a lot that we can do. So uh, I'll just wrap up with one of the things why I also believe that proportional representation is so important. Not only will it mean that we'll have parliaments that are going to actually be better because we can work together or in our case, push the government to deliver more for people. We also know that in the last election, in a very ironic twist and a cynical twist, the prime minister campaigned on fear of a conservative party. And that fear was based on the fact that they might form government. Well, earlier in a previous election, he had campaigned on ending the first past the post system, which would effectively never allow a party like the conservatives to ever form a majority government again. So he campaigned on a fear that he could have got rid of forever, which is a pretty cynical situation. And so I think that's one thing really important. If we could have a a proportion of representation, we would no longer have a campaign based on fear of 
of the conservatives winning an election with a minority of votes, and frankly, the liberals winning a majority of power with a minority of the support of Canadians. So that's something that I, I think we need to really work on. Um, our proposal is we would bring in a proportional mixed member proportional system immediately uh, once forming government. And then after two election cycles, allow Canadians to then having seen the system, vote to support it or not. Uh, we also believe very strongly in lowering the voting age. I think it would allow for more participation if we made voting, the voting age 16, then people in high school would begin voting and it would be a part of one's culture to vote. It would, it would make it easier. And I think it would create this, this practice that people would then, young people would get to do this as a part of school and they would know that this is something that they can do. I, I really believe that would be a powerful thing to do. And finally, what I, what I think about, when I think about proportional representation, the evidence has shown that it has resulted in more, uh, it has resulted in more uh, diversity of candidates being elected. And we know one of the, the glaring problems of our, of our electoral system is women are far underrepresented. Women make up, of course, half the population, but are dismally low in the percentage of members of parliament. That needs to change. And proportional representation is one of the ways to actually ensure that, that there is better representation, they, that those who are elected reflect the country better. And though that's something that we want to work towards, I think one of the things political parties can do is ensure that candidates reflect the country. So uh, I'm proud to say in the last campaign, we hit a pretty big milestone. Our, uh, our slate of candidates were closest to representing the census information from Statistics Canada about what Canada looks like. So we had uh, nearly 50% of our candidates were women. 12% of our, of our candidates were from Soji communities. 8% uh, of our candidates were indigenous. 11.5% of our candidates were youth. And 5% of, of our candidates were Canadians living with disabilities. We had also a significant percentage of, Canadian, of, of racialized members uh, of running for, for our party as well. So that to me was something I took on as a leader that I wanted to make sure that our our slate of candidates reflected the country and that we had those important metrics, despite the fact we don't have proportional representation yet, we are still able to at least have a slate of candidates that better reflect our country. So I'll leave you with that. And just again, in closing, I think this is a great discussion. I'm looking forward to your questions. I think it's a great time to reimagine the future that we can't go back to the way that we had lived before. I think this is a time for us to reimagine and, and aim for better, to move forward to something better, where we take better care of one another. There might be some folks, uh, conservative or maybe right wing, that are gonna say that taking care of one another is disastrous, that investing in people is impossible, and they'll raise the fear of debt and deficit. And of course, we need to be reasonable and responsible with the way we spend our money. We need to make sure that we're being fiscally responsible. But that does not mean giving money to wealthy corporations. It means investing in social programs like healthcare. It means investing in national daycare. It means building a sustainable economy that's more resilient and fair. That is the responsible thing to do. And I think that's uh, what I wanna pitch, that we can be responsible and invest in people and build social programs. And in fact, that is the right thing to do. And instead of the, the right-wing push of which is gonna be discouraged this feeling that we, we see out there in Canada, this feeling of wanting to help out one's neighbor and wanting to lift up the people around them. We need to build on that, I believe, and to build on that with real concrete notion, uh, national universal programs that will lift people up. And that's what I'm hoping to do. So with that, I'll say thank you so much and pass it back to the moderators. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jagmeet. That was great. Really appreciate you sharing your thoughts on Building a, a better Canada. To. Yeah, yeah, go for it. I forgot. I should have said this earlier, uh, just because I've been trying to be more vigilant about this. Uh, my name is pronounced Jug Like Hug. So it reminds us of Hug and Meet Like We Meet Each Other. So Jug Meet. Jug Meet. You got it. <laughs> Now watch me try to remember that for next time. Okay, so we got quite a few questions and a couple of them are sort of along the same lines and I think they're sort of a key question. So I'm gonna start with, uh, what concrete actions will you take in this parliament to advance policy on electoral reform? I think, and other people are asking the same thing, how can you use your position in a minority parliament to pressure this government for a step on electoral reform? 
Can't hear you. There you uh, are. So okay. I, uh, my lapel mic fell off, so I'm going to hold it as a, as a makeshift mic in my hand. Um, so some of the concrete things we can do, um, we have to first of all acknowledge that in a pandemic, a lot of things have now taken precedence and we want to make sure people aren't falling through the cracks and they get immediate financial help. You know that a lot of businesses are struggling, small businesses in particular. There's different sectors that have been hit harder like tourism and, and some of the service sectors those involved in arts and culture and festivals. So we need to make sure that those are priority. Long-term care is a priority. So the, the impact of the pandemic is gonna put healthcare and the care of our seniors to the forefront, rightly so. But given all those things, I do believe it's still an opportunity to show the impact that we've had in a minority government has been pretty significant. And I just see someone mentioning childcare. It's absolutely a priority. We laid out three key things to get back to work. It's paid sick leave making sure workers are safe and access to, to childcare. Those are the three things that people need now to be able to get back to work. Um, and so despite those things, I think it's still an opportunity for us to look at uh, pushing this government to say, well, we've seen the impacts and I'm hopefully getting support from not just fair vote, but getting Canadians behind this idea that, you know, we believe in it. We're ready to implement immediately mixed member proportional. It would get a, rid of the fear of a conservative majority ever again. And it would ensure that we've got at least uh, New Democrats pushing the government to, towards a progressive direction. So uh, I, I think there's an opportunity. How we do that and what the framework for that is something we're going to have to see as the opportunity presents itself. But it's something I believe in and something I'm going to continue to push. Okay. So another related question. Um, I think it's speaking more to the same thing, but how do you get all the parties or as many parties as possible on board for a next step to move forward on this? Well, we know for certain that uh, the Green Party has indicated support, so they're on, they're on board with this. Uh, the Liberal and the Conservatives don't really have much to gain. They've benefited from the first past the post system. They've both formed governments with it. And to be frank, the Conservative government will never be able to form a majority without the first past the post system. And the Liberal government probably wouldn't be able to form majority governments again, moving forward either. So uh, I think it's going to be the pressure of people. If people really get behind this and make this a really important issue, if we can raise that, that pressure from the public, that's really the only way we can get the political parties to agree. Uh, I agree and I wanna push for it. I believe in it for many reasons, but to get some of the status quo parties on side, it's gonna take a lot of work and a lot of convincing. Okay. Um, so I'm also having people asking, uh, so you know Fair Vote Canada has been pushing for a National Citizens Assembly on electoral reform as a next step that would possibly garner more multipartisan support than a specific thing, a specific model. What are your thoughts on that? I absolutely support it. I think it's always great to give power back to the people and giving people the ability to make the decision about what our elector electoral system should look like is a great idea. Uh, on my side, I guess I'm a part of New Democrats. We've looked at the different models around the world and looked yeah. at what would give the best results in terms of representation of racialized people, women, indigenous people, making sure that our, that our parliaments reflect the, the citizens. And we believe mm -hmm. that mixed member proportional is the best way to do that. And also to give the most representation, the most power to people's vote. So that's the position we've taken, but I absolutely would support a, a citizen led movement towards determining that question or that outcome, that answer, what is the best system for it? Yep, per on it, great. Okay, I'm just looking at the other questions. So a couple other people have asked, um, sorry to put you on the spot with this one, Jagmeet. No problem. <laughs> about the, whether the NDP and the Green Party could cooperate in some way in the next election to help improve uh, the prospects of proportional representation happening, improve their leverage, essentially. Yeah, I'm, I'm open to working with any party around moving forward uh, electoral reform, particularly mixed member proportional. So I'm open mm -hmm. to anyone who wants to push that forward. Okay. Um, okay, somebody's asking um, about 
Mr. Trudeau's preferred system, the alternative vote, winner take all ranked ballot, and what your position is on that? I think what the ranked ballot model does, it kind of consolidates the vote into the center. So it really gets rid of the diversity of opinion. If you rank it, uh, what, what we've seen in other jurisdictions where that is used, it, it really gets rid of uh, the progressive parties and, and I don't mind this, but the conservative parties, and it really favors a centrist party. And, and that I do mind. I don't think it actually helps us push things forward. In this, in this pandemic, every step of the way, the current government wasn't going to do things unless they were pushed. They were going to ignore students. We had to push them. Students organized and pushed them. And we made it a part of our agreement to move forward that they had to include students. They weren't going to do anything for seniors. They had indicated no interest in increasing the wage support the wage subsidy. So a lot of the way we had to push them. And so I don't think a ranked ballot would actually benefit Canadians. It would just keep things status quo. And looking at the status quo, it has not been good enough for us. I think we need and deserve far better. Yep. Um, what do you think? And I'm going to ask one more, then I'm going to turn this over to Jean-Sebastian to uh, pose a couple of questions. What do you think that the movement for proportional representation should do differently? In other words, uh, give us your advice on how to become a stronger, a stronger campaign. Well, w one of the things that, that really gets uh, people to, to move in a direction is if they see an electoral impact. And so what, what needs to be felt, particularly if we talk about the status quo parties, so the conservatives and the liberals, they need to know that this is an electoral issue. This is going to impact votes. So if the way to show that is numbers, if there's thousands of people that are corresponding directly with the local MPs, letting them know that this is an important issue, that their vote will depend on this issue, that's a potential way. But also a remedy. If, if there's a promise made and then that promise was broken, but then they, the government, for example, the Liberals case, they make a promise to change the system, they don't, and there's no, re there's, no, uh, there's no remedy for that or there's no repercussion for that, then the government doesn't really feel that it's an issue that they need to worry about. So in, that, in this case, I think some of the complacency is the Liberal government doesn't really think it's a big deal. They broke a commitment and they still maintained albeit less of a majority, uh, but they're still, they formed a government. And, and so that's what we need to do to make them feel the electoral impact. Okay. I just have to quickly uh, plug in my phone. I realize my battery's drained very quickly. So I'm sure. just going to shut my video off for one second while I do that. But my right. audio is here, so I can still hear you. Okay. Go on. Uh, Jean-Sebastian, do you want to take a few more off this list? Yes, well, maybe uh, still really good for the assembly. Um, Someone, actually a few per persons that asked if uh, we go uh, with a citizen assembly and the result is actually not going in a direction that the NDP wants. Uh, so uh, going with the MMP, if it's another model that comes out of the citizens assembly, what, what would be your position and how, how, would, you, how would you manage to, to move forward with this uh, recommendation of the citizen assembly? Well, um, if, if you're going to give the, the citizen assembly power, then we have to respect the outcome. Um, and this is kind of one of the, the gambles that, you, that you, we make as a society when we give power to, to people. It means that the outcome may not always be what we want, um, but that's, that's something that I think if we make that decision, we have to be prepared to, to go down the route of where, where the people want to go. Uh, I really want to see mixed member proportional. I think that's the best way forward and it's going to ensure the most voices are heard and it gives power to the people. But if we give power to the people to make the decision, then I think we have to respect those decisions. Mm -hmm. Maybe another one that I found quite interesting because it was related to Quebec uh, and was asking, what was your position on the actual current bill that we have in Quebec that is actually going in the MMP direction, but has so many features added to the to the bill that actually makes it very really difficult to defend and actually and there's also a referendum that is uh, imposed during the next uh, elections so uh, are, are there any for you deal breaker uh, you no know, elements that you would require to be uh, in, a, in, a, in a system to support or or elements that you want to uh, to oppose that uh, as we have 
seen here in Quebec in the, the bill uh, 39. So I haven't, uh, I haven't taken a really sharp look at uh, bill 39, but, um, but for me, I mean, really I've, I've, I've staked out my position really clearly. I think that the way forward is, is mixed member proportional. I know that the bill doesn't specifically mandate that, uh, but I don't have enough details about the bill to, to be able to give a, a detailed response. I can just say that the fact that it's being explored is encouraging and it gives me some hope. And if we see like uh, PEIs also uh, raise the, the potential of going in that direction, I think that when other provinces, hopefully if they land there, it'll give us more momentum to be able to push for it federally as well. And maybe a last one before going back to uh, Anita. Uh, in relation to the, the referendum uh, issue, uh, here in Quebec in the bill, they, they have included a referendum. Uh, and we know from you know, previous attempts uh, in the country that this is really a big concern uh, from many reformists. Uh, I, I hear from your proposition that you would want to have it implemented and then possibly have a consultation afterwards once people have experienced it and know the pros and cons uh, and know how to make you know, a, a decision on this. Uh, but what about if, if the, the deal you're, you're, you manage to get in, let's say, through a minority government and, and if we ever get a citizen's assembly, uh, if there's this element included uh, of a referendum, what would be your, your position on that? So I, I think the referendum uh, after the fact is probably the better way. Uh, we look at, at history for jurisdictions that have been able to pass this, have done it that way, where they pass the mixed member, the mixed member proportional, allow that system to work, and then gave citizens a chance to either accept it or reject it and return to the previous model. I think that is more effective than the upfront referendum, which we've seen it's difficult for people to imagine a new system and a new way of voting, and it's less likely to actually bring in change. Though people want change, and I think it's disproportionate or a majority of people want to change the system, when given the choices, then people will become nervous about a certain system and then revert back to the original and we don't get the change. So I think the way forward is to, to implement it and then to see if people accept it or not. Anita? Yeah, so here's an interesting question. Um, in practical terms, can you explain how proportional representation would be different from a minority government? Would it lead to more cooperation? And if so, why? Well, it would be similar to a minority government. Effectively, it would be the same idea. It would, it would mean that the percentage of, of seats reflect the percentage of votes. And so in, in any case that happens, it would be that uh, the government that has the most seats that wants to form government would have to work with another party to be able to pass legislation. And they could operate in a number of different ways. The way the current Liberal government is operating is vote by vote. So they've not, seek, okay. uh, not sought a formal agreement. In BC, the, the minority government's operating with a formal agreement, which lays out the terms of how the government will work while they're working in the minority setting. And then there's even more formal a coalition, which lays out you know, ministers are actually shared between the, the parties that are working together. Okay. So there are many ways to work together. The mixed member proportion would just ensure that there would have to be some form of, of working together for the government to be able to achieve any bill being passed in the House or in any legislation moving forward. And that's really the, the tool that we have is that if there is a requirement for a government to work with other parties, it's how we can see results. It's how we've pushed for things and in Canada, if we look at some of the amazing things that have happened, many of those changes have happened in a minority setting where New Democrats, in this case, in Canada's case, have pushed the, the governing party to do things that would be better for people. Um, okay, so somebody else has a question again. So in a minority government, it's more common that the government falls earlier than in a majority. Do you see this to be the case? with PR, or do you think that the shift in mentality would lead to longer periods between elections? Well, that's one, it's hard to predict. I think that we've seen examples both ways. We've seen yeah. 
sometimes examples of unstable governments that, that are formed when there is um, mixed member proportional electoral systems that result in multiple parties that have to come together to form a government. And in some cases that's been unstable in the sense of it's not lasted very long and sometimes they've been very, very stable. Uh, Germany has governed under um, forms of, of collaborative governments for a long period of time with great success and, and in quite stable way. So I think that it, it's variable, but I think the idea of would there be a culture shift, I think yes. I think that what we see with other examples is people get used to and, and parties get used to the idea that they're going to have to work with other parties. And that's factored into the decision making around uh, how long governments last there. They know that there's an expectation that they'll have to work together with someone. And I think that would, that would lean towards longer governments. Yep. Um, so somebody's asking, what's your view on empowering local and municipal and indigenous communities to adopt proportional voting systems? That was an interesting question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think when it, when it comes to municipal, I think that's easy to, to suggest that. Uh, I, would, I would love, I think municipalities should make that decision themselves, but I, I think that's, that's something worth considering. And in municipal settings, uh, the rank ballot might not have the same problems that, that are exposed in a, in a party system, the, the idea of everything going towards the center. It may not have the same risks, but, but the idea of getting municipal governments to be open to some proportionality would require um, some changes. It would work easily where there's a party system in some jurisdictions in Canada. In BC, for example, there is a party system. So that might work. Uh, but for indigenous governorship or, or sovereignty, I think this is where we have to be very careful. The problems have been that, that settlers have imposed governance on indigenous communities. So I would never want to be in a position as a settler to impose governance. And I think it's really incumbent on, on progressives, on people that care about indigenous sovereignty and justice and fairness that we work in a way that, that supports indigenous communities seeking to find their own governance and, and supporting that path to self-government and, and ways of establishing traditional governance rules and reestablishing practices that have been lost that have helped build more resilience in communities. So I think the role of federal and provincial governments when it comes to indigenous communities is to support their own sovereignty. All right, probably this is the last question. And it's very similar, but I'm coming back to a theme that's really important to us in Fair Vote Canada. Uh, so Canada's response to COVID-19 while under minority administration has been exemplary for the potential for coordination without majority control. How can we best make use of this opportunity to highlight the benefits of proportional representation? In other words, it's becoming very real for voters that they're getting benefits out of cooperation. In minority parliaments, so how do we maximize that message? Well, I think I think the the way we do that is by by telling people um, that the, the results we've gained have been because of this minority government. And and I say this without any exaggeration. Every step of the way, if you look at the government's response, the Liberal government's response, it has been improved, or the response has been created because of a demand by by New Democrats. In this case, there hasn't been any specific demands that either the Bloc or the Conservative have been able to push forward that I can point to. But I can point to uh, a numerous examples where we have actually pushed the government to do better. The, the curve was limited, we expanded it. Uh, one example was that the $1,000 woman awards. Jake Beat, I think I'm losing your audio. Oh. How's it now? Much better. Repeat okay. that last little bit. Okay, you know, I was just saying that um, even, for example, the, the $1,000 cutoff, initially, when people applied for CERB, they were not allowed to apply even if they earned a small amount of money. That's another example of something we pushed for. So if more people knew that a lot of the positive responses in this crisis came because a minor, in a minority government, a minority player, so in this case, the NDP, we pushed the, the government to actually do these things. And if people know that, I'm hoping people will see the merit of creating a system where there is more influence by other parties. And, and this is just one area where you can point to specific results. And I hope that if we do that, we can convince people that this is a better way to go. 
Awesome. I think that's a great place to end. We really appreciate your time, Jugmeet. Watch me get your name correct that yeah. time. Practice makes perfect. <laughs> okay, so I just wanted to thank Jugmeet for joining us and thank everyone watching uh, and those who asked so many questions, we couldn't get to everybody's questions. So I want to encourage everyone to join us all tomorrow. We have um, some really great guests. We have Frank Graves from Ecos Polling. We have Penny Earhart from New Zealand, who's going to talk about how MMP has improved democracy in New Zealand. And we have a campaigning and organizing session with Anna and, and Paul Manley. Um, I also want to give everybody a heads up that we will be hosting a Green Party Leadership Candidates Debate on Democracy. So watch your inbox for that. And one last note is when you log out of Zoom, you'll be directed to a donation page. Uh, so Fairville Canada is supported by individuals. This is your campaign. So we have not asked supporters for money since oh, about October and we're very, very conscious that so many people are struggling during COVID-19. But if you can support us, please do. It helps us put on more sessions like this, help reach more people with our message about how proportional representation and cooperation really make a difference in the lives of people and get our message out to more Canadians. So I wanted to say thank you again, Jagmeet, and everybody who tuned in, and good night. Good night, all. Thanks good so night. much. Thanks. Fairboats Canada. Thank you. <laughs>